Good afternoon. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Tammy Stenzel, and I serve as GAO's Disability Program Manager and Reasonable Accommodations Coordinator. And on behalf of the Human Capital Office and George Duncan, who's GAO's Diversity Program Manager, I want to welcome you all to um, our National Disability Employment Awareness Month event entitled Creating an Inclusive Work Environment for Employees with Disabilities. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Brandon Cox, who's with Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, and he's going to speak to us today about etiquette, disability awareness, and um, tell you everything you ever want to know about Maybe more. Maybe more. Um, for employees who are participating on the phone, or via GAO TV, um, there we have a handout. It is on the intranet site. You'll see it if you just go right to GAO's intranet site. You'll see it at the top, um, and a link to there's a link to the notice, and there it's right there in the notice. So if you'd like to view the handout, um, but Mr. Cox is going to be starting the speaking, so you don't need to have the handout in front of you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, uh, hello everyone. Like Tammy said, my name is Brandon Cox. I am the Director of Rehabilitation Services with the Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind. Uh, we're a local nonprofit that provides services uh, to DC, Southern Maryland, anywhere below Baltimore, and uh, Northern Virginia, anywhere above Richmond, basically. Uh, we've been around for 112 years. Uh, we provide services to individuals uh, all across the spectrum of uh, visual impairments. Um, my expertise is in the blindness field. Uh, today I'm going to try to cover uh, each of the major disability groups, uh, but most, most of the information that uh, I'm most of an expert on is going to be in blindness. So some of you may have some other things to share uh, that I may not uh, be aware of. Uh, I'm always learning every day. Um, so feel free to raise your hand if you have anything to add in. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so maybe best if you have something to add, we can uh, add it in during the Q&A time at the end. Um, one other thing, I'm also an orientation and mobility specialist for the blind. That means that I teach individuals who have recently lost their vision how to travel independently. Uh, whether they uh, are 50, 60 years old, or 12 or 13. Uh, we also work with children in school, uh, in college, all, all different parts of life. Um, throughout my experiences in working uh, with uh, individuals who are blind, uh, I've found that I'm working with people from all different types of disability groups. Uh, we have individuals who uh, have uh, physical disabilities, who are in wheelchairs, uh, individuals who are deaf, uh, who are deaf blind, who are not able to see or hear, uh, individuals with other cognitive uh, impairments uh, such as autism. Uh, so we get, we get to work with uh, all, all different types of indivi individuals. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to start off with today is to talk a little bit about disability in general. Uh, what does that mean to us as a population? Uh, what are what are some uh, maybe some misconceptions that some of us may have. Uh, for the most part, for the general population, uh, one of the biggest fears that people have is losing uh, some sort of normal function, whether it's going blind, losing your hearing, uh, losing a limb, you know, not being able to walk. So that fear uh, within the general population tends to cause uh, uh, some different biases that may be uh, underlying how we interact with others. Uh, so the, the way that I describe thinking about disability is, for instance, if everyone in the world was blind, <coughs> would blindness be a disability? No, it wouldn't, because the world would be set up for people who are blind, right? If all of us uh, were in wheelchairs, would we have a disability? No, because there would be no stairs anywhere. Everything would be accessible. So this is the philosophy behind uh, the accessibility movements, ADA, all these different types 
of uh, legislation that have come through to remove barriers to individuals who have disabilities. Because if we can create an environment, whether it's a physical environment, a working environment, uh, making you know taking out barriers such as being able to fill out an online application and having access to it, that gives everyone the same level playing field, right? So we're trying to remove those barriers uh, in order for individuals to have the same access as someone who would have uh, for full uh, normal function of all their other senses. Um, so now we're going to move into uh, a little bit more detail about. Uh, thinking about disability, the first thing that I want you to consider is what are your biases that may be underlying uh, that, that may cause differences in how you interact with someone. Uh, for instance, uh, if you walk into a room and you see a colleague uh, who is deaf, a colleague uh, who is blind, uh, are you, are you going to walk up to them and interact with them? Or are you going to kind of stand back? Well, she's blind. She can't tell that I'm in the room, so do I necessarily need to go over and speak to her? Uh, so it's very important for you to think about what, what is motivating you uh, to go out and interact with your fellow uh, employees, fellow staff members uh, who may have a disability. Whenever we're thinking about a disability, it's always important to recognize that a person who has a disability is still a person, okay? The person always comes first. Uh, I have many, many people who I work with who say, I hate being identified as that blind man. <coughs> so you're walking down the street, you see uh, a person who is blind uh, walking down the street, and you go, wow, look at that blind guy. No, that guy's name is Ed, and he works down at FAA. He has a wonderful family. You know, he loves dragon boating on the weekends. Uh, he has all these different uh, hobbies that he does, probably things that you would enjoy doing, that you would be surprised. Oh, wow, a blind man can do that? So you have to recognize that a person with a disability is still a person. Don't identify them as a blind person. Don't identify them as their disability. Recognize they are an individual. They are someone who deserves your respect, uh, who deserves to be treated like anyone else would be. Uh, the other thing uh, for just talking in general about how we're interacting with our fellow staff members, uh, think about the golden rule. How would I want to be treated? Okay? <clears throat> and sometimes you really have to think through that. For instance, if you're trying to get someone to come with you or you think they may need assistance, you may be tempted just to walk up and grab him and say, come on. But how would, you, how would you feel if someone just walked up and grabbed you? You would like for someone to ask first, right? So a lot of things that we're going to be talking about today, if you really think through something and think, how would I like to be treated in this environment? Uh, it's really just common sense. Uh, and so I just encourage you to take a step back and think, hmm, how, how would this affect me if I were in that same situation? I want to be treated as a human. I want to be recognized as an individual. Uh, in my office, uh, I'm a minority. I'm one of the only people who uh, has vision. So most of the people that I work with, my colleagues, are blind or visually impaired. I have a colleague uh, who is deafblind. So we have to learn all different types of communication skills and techniques, uh, especially when you're sitting in a room with individuals with different types of disabilities. For instance, I was in a meeting uh, for our deafblind advisory committee uh, last week. There were three individuals who uh, were deaf. Uh, they had vision. I had two individuals who were deafblind. And then I had a couple of people who were blind. Now, we have to think about, if you're, if you're working with in, in a group like that, you want to make sure that everything is accessible to everyone, right? So I thought ahead for the meeting. I said, uh, I'm going to send out everything in electronic format so that everyone uh, has the information, the agenda before they come to the meeting. Because I may not be able to provide everything, you know, you know, oh, this person needs it in Braille, this person needs it recorded, you know. But there's different different types of things that we have to think about as far as accommodating for meetings. Uh, but also to think, I want to interact with everyone who's in this meeting. 
do I only interact with the people who can hear me? Do I only interact with the people who can see me? People who are like me? So I encourage you to put yourself kind of in an uncomfortable situation and try to uh, interact with people who may not be like you. Uh, this, this is something that uh, you are going to find uh, much more fulfillment in your work. Uh, if, you, if you see a colleague that you pass by every day in the hallway that you've never spoken to, stop by and talk to them. They would love to meet you. You know, uh, they, they would love to know, oh, you pass by me every day? I didn't know that. Uh, so just providing that additional information is very helpful. Okay, so now we're going to move on and uh, talk for a few minutes about this communication tips uh, handout. And this does not include everything. It's very you know brief information that you can look at uh, to think through how you're interacting with fellow staff members. Um, the first point that's very important is don't be afraid to make a mistake. I just encourage you step out and take a risk and uh, try to do something that you haven't done before. And don't be afraid to make a mistake. We all do silly things that you know we may be embarrassed about, but it's okay. I mean, at least you're trying. At least you're uh, trying to put a hand out. Uh, the next thing: always be respectful. Uh, treat the person as an adult. Treat the person as someone who you respect. Uh, a lot of people will think if they see a person with a disability that something else must be wrong. For instance, I have clients who are blind who stand on street corners waiting to cross the street. We have people running up to them, whoa, 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 whoa what are you doing? You can't cross this street. You're blind. <laughs> okay? So there, there's, these, there's these biases that we don't even realize are there. We're trying to keep this person safe, but we're actually not respecting them by talking to them say, hey, are, are you okay? Would you like some help? Instead of running up and trying to be Superman, you know? Or assuming that you know better than they do. Oh, I know where you're going. Come on. Just just follow me. That happens all the time. And someone may end up somewhere where they never expected to be in the first place. Um, so, and that's the next point. Don't make assumptions about what a person can or cannot do. For instance, a person crossing the street. Or, uh, you know, oh, he's in a wheelchair. He must not be able to to do the same things that I'm able to do. Uh, so don't make assumption. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's the best thing that you can do. Ask the question, oh, um, is there anything that we can do to uh, help this be more accessible to you? Uh, if you have a staff member in your office and you're leading a meeting, make sure that they have the information that they need uh, to, as far as access. So if it's a PowerPoint, we use PowerPoints all the time, right? Can a blind person have a PowerPoint? They can, but they need to have it in advance. Okay, So you can send the PowerPoint to them, and they can use their screen reader before they come to the meeting to say, OK, I know what's going on here. But if I were in here with a PowerPoint right now, no one would know what was on the screen except for people with vision. OK? Uh, and also, if there's any other uh, additional information that uh, may be extremely detailed that could get lost in translation somewhere, even if you're working with somebody in a different language, uh, if someone is uh, interpreting you for you from English to ASL, uh, if it's a detailed document or something that you're trying to talk about in detail, send that out to the people uh, in the first place so that if they have questions, uh, they can come in ready with the, with those questions. Uh, and also, sometimes it helps speed up communication a little bit. OK, did everyone read through this document before we came in? And that way, you don't have to go through a long, full presentation. Um, oh, this is another really important point. Whenever you're interacting with someone who has a disability, and they may be with somebody else, talk to the person. If you're speaking to someone who is blind and they have a friend with them, don't ask the person who's standing next, next to them the question. If you're speaking to someone who is deaf, speak to that person, look at them, make eye contact, even if they have an interpreter. They'll go, hey, uh, interpreter, ask him ask him if he's hungry. You know, Ask him if he's having a good day. They'll say, Rocky, 
How's your day? How's it going? And they're going to receive the, you know, then it's clear that you're communicating with them and not talking to the person standing next to them. It happens all the time at a restaurant. So uh, we have people, uh, they'll walk in and uh, hand out menus and they'll ask the person who, so if it's a blind person sitting at the table, uh, they'll ask their spouse, what does he want? Oh, they'll ask him. Um, they'll contact, so in a work environment, they may contact a secretary who works with that person to say, oh, what does so-and-so need for this meeting? No, ask that person directly. They deserve the respect to be asked directly, um, and it's important for them to feel like uh, they're having direct communication with you instead of having to have a go-between. And uh, another, another funny example is standing at a grocery store, uh, the clerk will speak to the person who is with a person who is blind and say, it's five ninety nine. Well, he's standing right here. He's the one with the money in his hand. Talk to him. Okay. <laughs> Treat adults as adults. That's a, simple, that's a simple rule, but sometimes that's hard for some of us. Like some people are kind of, you know, uh, the mother we taught, they want to take care of everybody. And that's fine if that's your personality and you do that for everyone. But you need to think, am I doing this for this person because just because they have a disability? If that's the answer and it's not making things more accessible to them, then you may, maybe you need to step back. You need to encourage your fellow staff members uh, to do things on their own, to travel independently. Uh, it's fine to go to lunch with a fellow colleague who is blind, uh, but maybe, you know, incur encourage them to not just go to the cafeteria, but hey, let's go across the street. Uh, that, that's another very important thing when we're talking about workplace etiquette. If you're working in an office with someone, if they're deaf, uh, they can't, they may not necessarily hear all the conversations that are going on around the room. They may not hear, hey, I'm going to Starbucks, anybody want something? So uh, specifically for uh, a fellow colleague who is deaf, maybe uh, you could send them an email and say, hey, I'm off to Starbucks, can I grab you anything? If you would offer that to other people. Or walk in, write a note. A lot of people can read, read lips. Or if someone uh, is blind in your office, uh, they may hear you offer, uh, but if you, they, they may not really think, oh, they're not really talking to me. They're, they're, they're asking this other person over here to walk up and say, Ethel, do you, I'm going to serve her. Do you want me to grab something? So make it clear who you're uh, speaking to. Does that make sense? All right. Expect diversity in preferences of preferences and opinions. Some. Like I said, everyone is an individual, right? Everyone's a person. Everyone's not going to be an extremely, you know, kind person in every circumstance and be extremely thankful for everything that you do. You have to allow a person to be to have their own personality. Some of us are very harsh when we're talking to people. Some of us are very kind. So if someone says, no, I don't need that, you have to respect what they're saying. If someone uh, is you know, are, is very harsh back to you, you feel like they're being rude to you. Don't assume, oh, that person who was blind was just really rude to me. All blind people are rude. That happens. Uh, so don't make assumptions based off of one individual's reaction to you to the entire population. We know that, you know, across the board. Uh, all right, so let's move on and discuss uh, working with people with physical disabilities. This could be someone with crutches, someone in a wheelchair. Uh, there's all different ty types of mobility devices in someone with a physical disability. Uh, they, you know, they may have uh, amputations or may not have the use of their hands with CT. Uh, there's all different kinds of things uh, that uh, would be considered a physical disability. Once again, don't make assumptions about what the person can do. The second thing, respect their personal space. A lot of people are very tempted whenever they have a friend who is in a wheelchair to go, oh, hey, how, how are you doing? Are you going down the hall? 
they grab the back of the wheelchair and start pushing them. Okay? This is not a nursing home. This is not a hospital. That person gets around on their own some other way. Uh, it's inappropriate for you to grab their wheelchair uh, without asking. Now, if they say, hey, do you mind pushing me up the hall? Honestly, I would probably say, you know, you can do that on, on your own. Uh, but, maybe, you know, maybe it's like a rocky, you know, level, unlevel ground because you're going to lunch or something. They need help getting over it. That's fine. Uh, but you can expect them to do things independently. If they're working for the federal government here, they probably have the training that's necessary to take care of themselves. Uh, now, there's other, there's other support roles uh, that are identified as a support role with specific uh, tasks that are necessary, like a secretary or uh, a person who's a job coach, something like that may come in. But that's their role. Your role as a fellow coworker, that is not your role, okay? It's, it's fine to help in small circumstances like you would help anybody else in the office. But if you're taking it that extra notch up, you need to think about it, maybe talk to your supervisor and say, hey, is this, is this appropriate for me to be doing this? I know uh, you can always call the ADA office and ask questions as well. Uh, because that's also showing respect to that person, whether you realize it or not. Uh, but encouraging them to do things on their own, that's pushing them, <coughs> challenging them to say, okay, I know that I know how to do this and I need to do it on my own. Um, so respect the person's personal space. The next thing, when you're talking to someone uh, in a wheelchair and they're sitting down uh, at a lower level, why not pull up a chair and sit down and talk to them at their level, okay? I mean, if I, if I walk up and I'm talking to someone who's sitting in a chair, you know, it's like I'm an authority over you, right? So I'm talking to you. Whenever you sit down and uh, get down more on an even level, it's much more of a... Uh, uh, it's more of a conversation instead of being talked to. Uh, and they may say, well, why are you always sitting? And you don't, it's not like you walked up to, some, to somebody in the hall and go, oh, there's a wheelchair. I need to grab a chair real quick. But if you're in their office, if you're, you know, in a place that you're going to be stationary for a little bit, it's helpful uh, to sit down and uh, talk with them. <coughs> So uh, another physical disability is a speech impairment. That's someone who may stutter, who may have uh, you know some sort of difficulty with their voice box. Uh, it's important for you not to, and you're going to hear me say this again. It's important for you not to just go, yeah, uh huh, like you understand what they're saying. If you don't understand what someone said, show them the respect to say, sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Can you repeat that? And if you still can't hear it after a few times, find another way to get the message across, whether it's through an email, or writing it down, something like that. Uh, it is, I mean, many of you, you know, you may be talking to your husband, and he's sitting there watching TV going, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's not listening, right? So it does take a little bit more time to sit there and really listen to what the person is saying, but show them the respect to take the time to listen to them and get their clear message, okay? And it, that does require a, a large amount of patience. All right, next, working with people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, I, I will point out on this page, uh, there, there's different titles there. Uh, whenever, you're, whenever you're working with someone who is deaf, uh, it is okay to use capital D uh, when you're talking about the deaf culture. Uh, but, you know, some people choose, you know, they say, oh, I'm lowercase d, uh, because that's, you know, I'm a part of regular society, I'm not a big part of the deaf culture. Uh, and you're going to run into this the same way with uh, the visually impaired. And if you have any further questions about that, I would talk to some of your colleagues and say, hey, can you explain, you know, the differences of the hearing spectrum? Uh, now, you're going to notice a difference in how we title this uh, specific disability group. Uh, we don't say hearing impaired. We say visual, visually impaired. Uh, these different titles are, uh, they slowly evolve over time. Uh, like we have people now in the blindness community who are saying, we don't want to be called visually impaired. Why are we using the word impairment? Uh, so titles evolve. 
right now the appropriate term for someone who may have a hearing aid uh, or some, some other uh, hearing device, maybe even a cochlear implant, could be considered hard of hearing. Uh, most of the time, that part of the community is probably still taking, uh, is still able to hear uh, you speaking to them. And they're probably still, uh, a lot of times, able to speak. Uh, they may have a little bit uh, of a difference in, in how they're talking, but usually they're able to speak. Um, there's a broad spectrum for all disabilities, from physical disabilities to uh, the deaf community to blindness. So never, this is another point where you never make assumptions. Never assume, oh, this person can hear this. Oh, they can read lips. They can do this. So all people who are deaf cannot read lips. All people who are deaf do not use sign language. Some people use um, English sign language. Some people use American sign language. There's differences, okay? Uh, so you don't have to understand all that. Just understand that everyone is an individual and we treat and you, you need to figure out the best way to communicate with each individual. Um, and that's the first point here. Ask the person when you're working with someone who is deaf or hard of hearing how they prefer to communicate. Typically you can figure out pretty quickly uh, if they have an interpreter how to communicate. You're going to talk directly to the person and the interpreter is going to provide uh, the uh, information back and forth. Before you speak to a person uh, who is deaf or hard of hearing, make sure that you have their attention. Make sure they can see you. If anyone who has a sensory impairment where uh, they lose one of their senses, they're going to be depending on their remaining senses for their input. So for instance, someone who is deaf is going to be pretty dependent on their vision. So that means you need to be looking at them and have eye contact with them when you're talking to them. Someone who is blind is going to be very dependent on being able to hear you. So you want to make sure that you're standing close enough, speaking clear enough so that they can understand you. Someone who is, has vision and who has hearing, we're getting input through our vision and also through our hearing at the same time. So most of you in here, if you have hearing and vision, you are listening to me by hearing me, but also seeing my lips move. So you're getting both of those types of information. For someone who uh, has a hearing loss or a vision loss, they're going to be dependent on those other senses. Uh, whenever you're working with someone who uh, is deaf or hard of hearing, you need to be clear uh, and expressive whenever you're talking. Now, this does not mean that you need to start talking like this. It does not mean that you need to start talking very loud. A person who is deaf, if they cannot hear, no matter how hard you, how loud you talk, they're not going to be able to hear you. So. Whenever you're thinking about these things, you, if, if they do have some uh, ability to hear you, uh, if they have a hearing aid, you want to talk slow, you want to talk clear, uh, but don't, don't overdo it, okay? Don't get up in their uh, ear and yell. Hearing aids are set to where, uh, they're, they're set for regular tone, not loud noises. And for someone who can read lips who may not be able to hear you, they read lips of individuals who speak at a normal rate. If I start talking like this, they're going to go, I have no idea what he's saying. He's making funny faces. All right. We cover a lot of these things. So, the, and make sure that you keep eye contact with the person. And if you turn and you know turn your back to the wall or something, then you think, oh, they're gone. I guess the conversation's over. And it's also helpful to end the conversation. Say, oh, it was great talking to you. I'll see you later. Instead of you know, um, are we still are we still communicating here or not? Also, if you're working with someone who reads lips, make sure they are able to see uh, your lips while you're talking. So if I'm writing a note to somebody and I'm talking like this, they're not going to see my mouth moving, so they're not going to hear what I'm. They're not going to be able to 
understand what I'm saying. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about cognitive disabilities, uh, but for the most part with cognitive disabilities, this could even include a learning disability. Uh, most disabilities, you don't even know that they exist. Uh, and so don't ever make the assumption that everyone around you uh, has normal function. A large part of uh, our population has some sort of disability. Uh, so always treat everyone with respect. Don't assume that someone is, you know, making assumptions about someone, uh, their intelligence or something like that. They may they may have a disability that they uh, have to accommodate for in some other way. So this discussion is really helpful for being respectful to all of our peers at work to understand. Oh, something else may be going on that I'm not aware of. You know, making fun of people who stutter. Uh, all things, things that we did in grade school, but we still are, some of us are still doing, okay? Uh, I know, I know what happens. We're all tempted to do that, so. Uh, all right, I'm going to move on to uh, visual impairment. Yep, because we are almost done. All right, so whenever you're working with someone who is visually impaired, First of all, let's talk about the spectrum. I've included it in here. For the uh, blindness spectrum, we call everything the umbrella is a visual impairment. One end of the spectrum is low vision. That means that the person is still living in the visual world, okay? They're still using their vision for their main input. They're still reading print. It may be large print, they use magnifiers, but they're still receiving most of their information through their eyes. Then we move a little further down to what's called legal blindness. Legal blindness is where they're really making the transition from the visual world to what we call the non-visual world, using the other senses, touch, feel, hearing, taste, whatever that might be. Then we move further down the spectrum to the end, which is what we call total blindness or blind. It really doesn't matter. Uh, so whenever you see someone with a cane, a lot of people, the first assumption that they make is, oh, he's blind. That means he can't see anything. Most of the population that you're seeing with a cane out there is not totally blind. Most of them have some residual vision. They may have uh, a field loss where they can't see the ground, but we don't want them to have to walk like this looking at the ground. So that's why they have the cane, so that they can keep their head up and walk confidently. So don't make assumptions that the person cannot see anything. Uh, also, don't walk up to them and go, how many fingers am I holding up? You would be surprised how many people do that. Um, whenever you're talking to a person who is visually impaired, speak directly to them. We've already covered that. The next thing is extremely important, and I talked a little bit about this whenever uh, I talked about walking down the hall. If you pass the same person every day, and you generally say hi to people in the hallway, Say hi to someone who's, who you're walking past uh, who's blind. Uh, they would appreciate it. If you work in an office and you walk in and don't say anything, that person is not going to know that you're there. Uh, those of us who have vision, we can see when someone comes in. Those of us who have hearing, we can hear when someone comes in. Otherwise, we can't. So it's always really nice to announce yourself when you come in. Good morning, how are you? It's Brandon. And I learned this the hard way when uh, I first started working at CLB full time. Uh, I worked in the office with two colleagues who were totally blind. And one day I walked in and I sat down on my computer and started using my computer. And they just let me have it. They're like, Brandon, we didn't even know that you were here. What if we wanted to be talking about you right now? And you were <laughs> uh, so they were like, usually we know that you're coming in because we can hear your keys. We know those are your keys whenever you walk in. But you're being really quiet today. You must not have your keys in your pocket. So if you're communicating with somebody, if you work with somebody in the same space, let them know when you're there. Also, let them know when you're leaving. It's the worst thing when somebody's trying to talk to you, and they may be having a full conversation with you, and you're not even there. Or you walk in, and you go, who are you talking to? You're talking to yourself? Uh, so it's nice to let people know when you're there. It's just a matter of saying, hey, or bye. And... Don't play the game of disguising your voice and going, hey, who is this? Can you guess who this is? <laughs> Happens all the time. 
Uh, unless you're just a real jokester and you would do that with anybody. Uh, but it's not, it's not a fun game to play. Uh, so announce yourself when you come in or out. Also, if you're talking to somebody and you need to walk off and do something real quick, say, oh, hold on just a second. Don't just walk off because they're going to keep going and you're going to come back and they're going to have to repeat what they said. Once again, you do not have to shout to a person who is visually impaired. Their vision is not that great, but their hearing is probably still okay. A lot of people feel the need to grab on to a person who is blind when they're talking to them for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, if, you're, if you're a touchy person and you would touch someone anyway when you're talking, that's fine. Otherwise, keep your, keep your hands up. Uh, if a person needs your assistance, uh, it's fine for you to walk up and say, hey, can I, can I help you with anything? And if, you, if they need to be guided somewhere, I'm going to, uh, I did a full handout on this called Human Guide Technique. Honestly, read it. Uh, it's going to give you all the information that you need. I'm not going to go into detail on it. But in general, if someone needs help and they need to be guided somewhere, don't walk up and grab them. They are to grab your elbow, okay? So they get they get your elbow right here, and you don't walk up and uh, like grab them and go here you go. Just walk up, touch their arm, okay? Just put the back of your hand to their hand. They'll come up your elbow and hold on to your elbow. And then you just walk normally. You don't have to walk like a tin soldier. Uh, you just walk normally. You are their guide, so let them know when stairs are coming. They'll teach you how to do it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Say, "Hey, I've never guided a person who's blind before. Am I doing this? Am I doing all right? You know, any you know any pointers that you can give me?" And they'll they'll appreciate that. Um, and do not assume, even when you're out, uh, the the person always needs help. For the most part, if you see a person out in the metro, they're not going to be down there unless they know what they're doing. So don't feel the need to be Superman down there and keep people from falling off the platform. Once again, never push, pull, or grab a person who is blind. This happens all the time when you walk up to escalators. The person's coming up, they're looking for the escalator. They have to, you know, a person who's blind has to touch things, okay, just so that they know what's going on. They need to touch the rail to go, is this escalator going up or down? So I don't want to go the wrong way. All the time, we have people coming up, grabbing the person from behind by the shoulders and going, here you go. How would you feel if somebody did that to you? You may not even want it to get on that escalator. You may have wanted to go down instead of going up. Uh, so just be cognizant of that. Another thing that we commonly see is people will grab by the wrist and try to guide that way. Uh, that's how we treat children. We grab the kid by the hand or the wrist and say, come on. The people that you're working with are adults, so you should treat them as adults. Even as if you're their guide and they're holding onto your elbow, they're still independent because if they don't want to walk with you, they can let go. If you have contact with them physically, they cannot let go. Okay? If they decide, oh, I'm, you know, I'm good, I don't need to do this, uh, they can release and go. Oh, the next thing. Don't ever be nervous about using the word, like different uh, uh, sensory words, like, oh, did you see that? Or look at that? Did you hear that? Did you, you know, I mean, we hear news, but you hear news through the newspaper, you hear news through the internet, right? Don't tell your blind friend, hey, did you watch that movie last night? I mean, sorry, you can say, did you watch that movie? Did you hear that movie last night? That's not our vocabulary, okay? So it's fine to do, they're gonna joke around with you. Oh yeah, I saw that. Uh, I do that, I work with blind people every day, and I'm always saying, oh, look at that, did you see that? Da -da -da -da. Uh, always, like, sending an email, like, with an attachment to it, see attachment. I get so many uh, responses. Uh, the next thing, if someone's asking for directions, don't go, uh, which way is the bathroom? Oh, it's right over there. Doesn't work. And if you really want to get technical and really good at giving people directions who are blind, give them to the, give directions in cardinal directions. What are cardinal directions? I know. North, south, east, and west. The reason being, if I'm uh, 
giving someone instructions, and I'm giving you instructions, and you ask, uh, where is the coffee bar? So, um, and I say, oh, it's to the right. No, it's to your left, right? But if I said it's to the north, it's that way, okay? So uh, people who are visually impaired, are you're going to serve them best by giving card directions. Now, don't give card directions if you don't know them. <laughs> that'll really mess things up. Yeah. They said, I, you're like, oh, north changed. They, they moved the compass today. But be careful about giving signals or gestures that you're not explaining uh, whenever you use them. All right, the back page talks about other uh, sensory input. We all take things visually. Uh, you, if a person is blind and they don't have their vision, it's helpful to have tactile information that's feeling. So like we have tactile maps, we do all, all different types of things for people. Or if, a per if you're showing like a new, I don't know, product or something, hand it to the person so they can feel it instead of trying to explain it. Oh, the one other thing. Don't feel like you're a narrator of a film. We're walking down the hall. Oh, the, the ground is green. We just passed a doorway. There is, that is not necessary at all. Do they care? No. Uh, when you're walking outside. Oh, we just, we just passed a fire hydrant. They don't care. Now, if it's a nice day, and you're like, wow, the sky is blue and beautiful, that's great. But don't feel like you have to narrate, oh, crack in the sidewalk, crack in the sidewalk, crack in the sidewalk. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you're just going to be narrating all day long. Now, there are, there are movies and stuff like that where you can get descriptions along with the movie. So if you're ever showing a film or something like that, see if there's a descriptive film available. Uh, and then they're giving, they're giving more detail about what's actually happening in the movie. All right, so there's a lot of other things that I could share with you, but uh, hopefully, in general, you uh, got some good ideas today. Uh, we can probably go, yeah, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, please feel free now. Uh, we'll go into a Q&A time. You can ask any question that you want. Uh, no question is a dumb question. Uh, and step out, take a little risk, and ask something that you're like, no, oh, I'm not sure about this. Yes. I want, wait, but okay. I want to get, is there anybody on the phone? Yeah. Oh. Do you have a question? No, I'm sorry. I thought the question was, is anybody on the phone? So that was. <laughs> <laughs> good job. Good job. <laughs> All right, yes. Do you just have a question about like, the sensory input that you're talking about you know, being proactive if you're working with people? Abilities to you know, send the PowerPoint presentation in advance, for example. But then at the same time, you don't want to make any assumptions about the person. So would a person with a disability, you know, tell you what resources they may or may not need, or if, I just if you if you know they have a disability, okay, um, you can ask them. You can say, you know, what, how how do you prefer to receive media? Uh, and if you can provide things in Braille, if the person's a Braille user, uh, then do that. Uh, if it's something that's going to be a detailed document, they probably need Braille if they're a Braille user. Don't assume a person who is blind knows Braille. Don't assume a person who is deaf knows sign language. Okay. And also another thing that I forgot to mention, when you're in a meeting environment and uh, we have an interpreter like this, uh, the individuals who are deaf in the room are watching the interpreter. So if it changes who is talking, it's important for you to say, like for me to say, this is Brandon. So that they know, oh, this is Brandon talking. So they're not looking around the room going, who's talking? Okay. Uh, so that's another really good uh, hint that I forgot to include. Uh, does that answer your question? Kind so of, you, you it ask. just seems like there's a tension sometimes between wanting to be proactive and make things, you know, as accessible as possible, right. but then at the same time not making any assumptions or you know, well, I mean the. Them. The other option is, would it really hurt for everybody to have that PowerPoint in advance or that document in advance? I don't sit in my office and go, okay, this employee's deafblind. I need to make sure he gets this information. This employee's blind. No, it's helpful for everyone to have it. And usually if you can get it in your email inbox, a PDF, a Word document, it's usually going to be accessible, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So if you have a meeting of your team, if there's going to be documents, send them out to everybody. That's another option. 
So could, you don't have to format it any differently. They, no. they will have the resource right. to right. interpret it however they need it. That's right. And if they don't, they'll let you know. Okay. They'll say, oh, I can't open this document. Or, oh, this PDF is not readable because some PDFs aren't readable. Uh, and they can, usually the person can say, oh, you need to do this to it to make gotcha. it accessible. They're really good at letting you know when something is not accessible that you send. But they may not come to you and say, hey, you know, I need you to make sure that you're sending you the stuff to me unless they're extremely proactive. Ethel? Brandon, <laughs> the people here at GAON have really been very, very supportive, almost too supportive, uh -huh. in the essence that, you know, I can't even walk the halls without somebody <laughs> just, you know, can I, can I help you? How do you strike a balance? Because <laughs> I don't sure. want to be rude. But See, <laughs> this is right. We have all these questions all the time, mm -hmm. uh, even, mm -hmm. even from my clients who I work with who are blind. How do I not be rude to people? Yes. <laughs> And that's why I said you all need to treat people as individuals and ask before you're giving assistance. So say, hey Ethel, how's it going? Uh, where are you headed? Oh, I'm going to the bathroom. Do you need any help? No, I got it, thanks. Uh, instead of going, Ethel, where are you going? Bathroom. Oh, okay, come on, let's go. I'll go with you. Ethel may not want a buddy to go to the bathroom with her. Okay? Is that helpful, Ethel? Yes. <laughs> I um I just started working with somebody who is deaf, and we're going to be having lots of meetings with agencies and associations, sometimes in person, sometimes in school or phone. Is it appropriate or inappropriate for me to discuss that with them ahead of time, with the other with agencies that people are meeting with, or or not? That, that's a good question. So to say we're going to have a, a person who is deaf on this call. You can answer. This is Tammy. Um, if you are arranging a meeting ahead of time, and if the employee needs a sign language interpreter or CART services, you need to, when you're notified, talking to the liaison, you need to notify them, tell them ahead of time, because there are logistical arrangements that need to be made mm -hmm. in advance. So okay. it, is, it is appropriate, and I can provide you with some form letters, and I can work with you on that as well. And, We've done that successfully. If it if the flow changes, uh, so if, if you have people with different communication uh, media that they're using, um, the flow of the meeting is going to change. Mm -hmm. So if you have a group of people in a room who uh, are not deaf, who are not blind, everyone may be talking at the same time, and you can do that. Uh, but it's helpful if you have people with different uh, communication abilities, you're going to, maybe you could even set rules at the beginning of the meeting to say, okay, if you need to talk, raise your hand or say, I need to say something uh, so that you, you keep a structure to the meeting instead of people talking all at once. Mm -hmm. um, and also say if you have an interpreter in a meeting, uh, sometimes interpreters need a break and they have to switch. Mm -hmm. So during an interpreter switch, you need to stop the meeting because then that person who is deaf loses access to the meeting. Okay. Good question. Or comments or additions to what I said. Yeah, I just have, I'm not sure this is appropriate, but anyway, how does a blind person learn a city? You know, I see it from a visually handicapped, some of them have canes, okay, but how do they know right. where so, the metro stop is? And uh, That's what I teach. So orientation and mobility uh, is the art of teaching someone how to travel independently. That includes orientation, knowing your way around. Uh, a blind individual in this city probably knows the city better than you do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They know the specific <laughs> landmarks that are on different corners. They know, okay, number of streets in the city run north and south, letters run east and west. Uh, I know the different grids of this, you know. Does, any, like, does anyone in this room know where the DC grid originates from? What is the location where it starts from? Capital. Good job, good job. A lot of people don't know that. We have a giant compass that lays on top of the city. <laughs> north Capitol is the north end of the compass. Uh, so once we teach those things, they use technology, iPhones, uh, Google Maps, uh, we're actually, uh, doing a new project starting in January where we're literally going to map the entire city 
uh, for a person who is blind or visually impaired based off the metro station. So they can go to points of interest and get the exact route to get there that's safe that one of us uh, developed. So are you saying someone has, has, has shown them how to get, like, no. in the apartment over here, and right. so that's the safe way over there, they have to know, someone has to show them first? Or they don't. So that's what we call route travel. So if a, if a person lives in an apartment and they go, okay, I'm going to go to the safe way every day, we may teach them that route. Let's say they want to go somewhere else uh, that they've never been to before. They can take an address. Uh, they can use uh, different uh, types of technology, trip planners, whatever it might be, to figure out how to get there on their own. They may need to call ahead to the business they're going to, whatever it may be, and say, hey, um, I know that y'all are at uh, 1426 9th Street, but where are you at on the block? You know, are you on the corner? You know, oh, so you're at the intersection of 9th and P. Are you on the northeast corner, the northwest corner, which corner of the intersection? So they can ask those different types of questions uh, to uh, determine the location that they're going to. Now everyone, this is another thing, don't assume everyone knows how to travel independently. Uh, they, may, they may not be, they may only travel four different places and that's it. And that's fine. But for the most part, the people that you see all over the place, all around the city, uh, they're probably going to be uh, they can probably get anywhere that they want to go. And it's not just here. I mean, the skills and the tra So we, we have a program called Foundations of Adjustment to Blindness. It's a, the FAB program. It's a two-week program where we bring people in who have never uh, had any kind of training before. They've recently lost their vision. And by the end of two weeks, we have them with a cane, crossing streets, going to places that they've never been to before. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Ethel did that. Uh, so for, for the final for O&M, we say, okay, uh, I want you to go to uh, the southwest corner of the intersection of 7th and M and find the escalator. That's about seven blocks away from our uh, building, and they had never gone this direction before while they were training. And 95% of the people make it. Uh, and then we expand on for one on one training. <laughs> the other five percent are probably going to be those route travelers, people who have, you know, they may they may have uh, need more in depth training. Uh, some people can't pick up everything in a couple, of, and we don't teach everything. That's why it's called foundation. But uh, it's we put sixty people through the program this year, and they're all uh, doing extremely well. So. But it's it's amazing. It's it's never it never hurts to ask. I mean, I ask my blind colleagues all the time, "How did you, you know, how did you get here?" Uh, and they just laugh at me. But uh, so it's it, it's it, it is incredible, but it's not like a superpower. Okay, a lot of people think, "Oh, this person is blind, so they must be able to play the piano by ear." Okay, everyone is not Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder. Okay. Uh, or, oh, this person is deaf. They must have really good vision. You know, they've learned to use their vision really. You know, uh, they can see through walls. Uh, some people make those assumptions, and the the fact is, they're learning. Uh, they're learning to use their other senses better. So if I if I put a blindfold on you for the rest of the day, I guarantee you, you would start using your hearing a lot better. Thanks. Imagine that for the rest of your life. It's just going to keep your other senses. You're going to get more in tune to using. Any final um, questions? I had a question to John Grant. Um Some person with visually impaired, visually impaired, they use a guide dog. Um, um, is there a preference in the, the visually impaired community versus the mind, uh, the guide dog versus the cane? <laughs> And, and what is it that determines that a person I mean, how do they how does the guide dog know that they want to go to 11th and G Street or something like that? <laughs> great, great question. I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention something. Anyone with a service animal that you see, they're a working animal. Okay, so that means that you can't walk up and just pet them whenever you want to. You always have to ask first, and don't think the person is being rude when they say no. Don't touch my dog. The reason they don't want you to touch their dog is because their dog is working, and he's going, okay, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. Oh, someone's just petting me. I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. Uh, so that's why they're doing it. They're not trying to, like, abuse the dog. But they're just trying to keep him focused on his job. 
And like some guide dogs, they'll just go and, you know, they get to work, they lay under the desk, and that's what they do all day. They love it. They just lay there. Uh, so always be respectful of guide dogs. Even on the metro, don't walk up and go, oh, your dog is so cute. It's okay to ask and say, hey, can I, can I pet your dog? Looks like they're off duty. Can I pet them? And some people are really nice. Like one of my colleagues is very nice. Other people are not. No, you can't touch them. Uh, but the question as far as, you know, how, does the pre how is the preference determined? How do you use a guide dog versus a cane? A cane, you're really touching everything. Every step that you take, you're touching it first. Some people don't like that. They don't like walking down a sidewalk, bumping into things, and having to straighten up. Because no matter how good you are at walking in a straight line, at some point you're going to touch something and bump into it. A guide dog is like an express lane. A guide dog walks from corner to corner, avoiding all obstacles. Okay, So they're holding on, and they're just going with that guide dog from corner to corner. He's going to take them around everything, stairs, whatever it may be. Now, some people don't like that because they're like, oh, I want to know what's on this block. I want to know what I'm passing. But a guide dog, you're really going right by it. Uh, so the question, can a guide dog, can you say, uh, hey, Scruffy, go to uh, McDonald's? <laughs> no, you can't. Uh, guide dogs basically know like three or four commands. They know forward. They know left. They know right. Maybe, you know, something having to do with them going to the bathroom. Uh, they know obedience training, sit, all those different types of things. But they are not, you can't, like, program them to go wherever you want to. <laughs> now, do they learn routes? Do they learn, oh, I know how to get home? Yeah. Then you can kind of go on autopilot and just go. But it's not, it's not like you can program them to go somewhere that they've never been before. Does a dog decide to cross the street when it's safe to cross the street? No. Uh, they're still listening to traffic and determining when it's safe to cross the street. The handler is, the person who is blocked. Now, guide dogs are taught something which is really cool called intelligent disobedience. Where if, a, if they're standing at a corner and they tell, say, Scruffy, forward. And Scruffy's like, oh, there's a car coming. And they take, the handler takes a step out into the street. Scruffy will put his body up against the person and block them from moving. And they go, oh, there must be a car coming. And they'll step back. Some guide dogs are very incredibly protective. They will sacrifice their life for their handler. They will put themselves between the car and the handler. Um, a lot of people, like if you're not a dog person, you're not going to want a guide dog. There, it's a lot of extra work. You have to keep them on a strict schedule. You have to keep their weight at a certain level, or it's going to, uh, you may be fined or something like that. So, any other questions about that? Um, I do have cards up here. Uh, if anyone has any follow-up questions that I'll uh, leave with you at the end. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.